Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. No. Hello. Hey, there you go. Now it's on. Good afternoon, everyone. Did everyone enjoy lunch? Okay. Is everyone ready for two final sessions for the afternoon? Fully energized, ready to engage. It's always hard when we come back from lunch. It's like that gets warm and everyone starts to get a bit sleepy. So um, hopefully this panel session will be really engaging. So uh, I'm Andrew Johnson. I'll be the moderator for today's panel session. Um, I'm the manager of student enrichment here at UniSQ and also the convener for the operational group for SVA. So um, I'm really, really excited to be here and bringing a whole range of really fantastic panelists with us. Now we actually have panelists joining us in person, obviously, and we have a, a few panelists joining us online. <coughs> So hopefully all of that will work seamlessly and we won't have any technical problems and it will be fantastic. So um, we might start with some introductions from the panellists so you can get to know them. Um, so I'll start with the panellists here in the room um, so we can get acquainted. So um, Jeff, Chris, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, hi, I'm Jeff. Yes, it's on. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, hi, I'm Jeff. Um, I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic at University of Canberra. Uh, worked at a few universities. Um, have actually been passionate about um, student voice. And I know behind me up here on the screen, there's a couple of my colleagues up there who I've been involved with for a number of years um, in looking at how we can actually include the student voice in decision making. Um, that's something that I've been really quite passionate about. Yeah, that'd be great. And, and you're a member of the steering group, aren't you, for, for the SBA? So thank you. Whoa, yes. Um, and Bailey, so you've come to Springfield from University of Sunshine Coast. Do you want to yes. give us a bit of an intro for yourself and your journey as a student? Okay. Um, my name's Bailey. Hi. Um, before I start, I'm going to explain that I have autism. I get nonverbal when I get nervous. Um, and to help with that, I have flashcards even for telling you who I am. Um, so, excuse me for a minute. Um, so yes, I'm a second year social work student. Um, <clears throat> I came to do that by um, first applying to do marketing and event management. Um, and so I applied to university to do that, went to the NDIS, said, hey, I need some help to go to university. They said, no. I spent a year at home twiddling my thumbs and decided to become a social worker instead. Um, so here I am. Um, when I started my degree, there was an advertisement for a student representative to be on the Disability Action and Inclusion Plan uh, Working Committee, and I applied for that. And I got that, went to the first meeting, the Pro Vice Chancellor for Students introduced me, and I was like, oh my God, she knows my name. Um, <laughs> and so that kind of set me off to being a student rep in our Students as Partners program. I realized they didn't have a disability section under that so we made that happen um, and now I am also convener of the um, Students with Disability Leadership Collective through SVA. Thank you very much and we really appreciate you being part of the SVA community because uh, I know it's not your first gig so thank you very much. Um, we might go online now um, so we have uh, two panellists joining us online and just heads up we might have a third panellist that may drop in at some point and we'll um, Endeavor. So if you see another person jump on the screen behind you, if you can just all wave your hands frantically <laughs> so I can look back, that'd be great. Um, so uh, we might move to our second student on the panel. So Jonathan, um, so you're a PhD student at Mana, um, Monash um, and you've been quite involved in the rep space. Can you share a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure thing. So thank you for having me here. Um, so I'm a PhD with the Department of Management at Monash University and I think it's important just to give an idea of my experience and my journey on how I got to where I am. So my PhD looks at studying processes of change and how our understanding of who we are as individuals and our identities may contribute to wider organisational or institutional change. And so I found that this passion came about uh, when I worked for a bank when I was in my undergraduate degree and doing my commerce degree. And I discovered uh, systemic 
wage theft in this bank. And in the process of advocating uh, for this space, I realized how the union had been systemically uh, blocked by an email from uh, discussing or entering the workplace from the mid-2000s. Uh, mid and I'd left the bank since that was all published in the Australian Financial Review, but it actually demonstrated to me how change is really intertwined with voice, but also silencing. And it was from that experience during my undergraduate course that compelled me to learn about how change comes about, how we better facilitate change in more sustainable ways. And so that's what put me into studying this area in my honours and now in my PhD. And today, outside of my PhD research, a lot of my volunteer time is spent uh, engaging in change activities in the higher education space. I'm the Faculty of Business and Economics HDR representative. I'm also the Humanities and Social Sciences HDR representative on the university's Central Graduate uh, research committee. I'm the vice president of the Monash Graduate Association, uh, which I'll talk about a bit in a moment, um, and the HDR representative on the university's academic board as well. And some of the big highlights in my time in these roles have really been building a strong HDR network and also campaigning for an increase in the RTP stipends and developing strategic capabilities within our graduate association. And so there's a lot there, but I think it's important to give an idea um, for our audience what that looks like and how I'm here, where I am today. Thanks, Jonathan. And I think facilitation of change, working in the higher education, um, either as a, as a student or as a staff member, the one thing that we can probably be assured of is that there is always change in the sector. Um, so really keen for your insights in the space as we talk uh, through this in, in SVA. So, um, also excited to introduce you to Sally Varnum, and many of you obviously uh, might already recognise the name. Um, so the SVA Symposium would not <laughs> would not feel right without her participation, um, as Sally's the reason we're, we're really all here today. Um, so her tremendous work on the pilot project in 2019 resulted in the development of the Step Up Principles, um, widely used amongst most people in the room and online, and of course the establishment of this network. Uh, so please, Sally, um, uh, can you give us a little bit of an introduction for yourself? That'd be great. Anyone who knows me well will know that it's very risky to ask me to talk about myself in the context of student voice. <laughs> but So I might have to be stopped. Um, but I can't, before I start, I can't um, go any further without giving a big shout out to the people who have helped me along the way, who have been so... Um, who have been so good, have really done all the work. First of all, Anne Carhill, who was my first manager, and then Kate Walsh, and who really ran Student Voice, the Student Voice Australia pilot project, and then Piper Bell, who took it over when I went home back to New Zealand from the University of Adelaide, and now the University of Southern Queensland with Anna and her team. Um, so I'm very excited and very honoured to be here. Uh, it's so amazing to see how it's grown and to see how far it's come. Um, how, how did it start? As a legal academic, first of all, in New Zealand, and then when I was masquerading as an Australian at UTS, um, I have always had a strong interest in the role of education in, in developing citizens, um, able to assimilate information and make decisions. Um, and I think that if, I, I thought that it's schools as well and universities who fail to engage have meaningful engagement with students at all ages in decision making are really um, missing a huge opportunity, not only for the institutions, but for the students' personal and professional development. So what happened? I, when I first got to UTS, I co-led a research project, which was um, about um, university student grievances. And one of, the big, um, one of the big findings of that project was a feeling of disempowerment. Um, we, Lucy talked about power before, but that was, it was a really, we actually pushed for um, an ombud in the sector. But um, one of the strong, strong findings that we got out of that was that students felt disempowered. They were, they were student, there were decisions being made about them in every way about their courses, their you know, institutions, whatever, um, without their being consultant consulted. So then at UTS for my sins I went on to become chair of academic board and we had eight students on academic board and I found it really hard to engage them. 
Um, they didn't really know what they were doing there. And um, there just wasn't a culture of they're having meaningful engagement. Um, it was more about their CVs, I think. And then I went on to university council and um, it became a bit confusing for everybody else who I was actually representing on council because I helped, I worked with the students <laughs> as well, getting their voices heard. Um, in my career, I've attended lots and lots of conferences which where the discussion, the focus is all about students. And it used to be that there was barely a student in sight. Um, so I basically, it started me thinking, how could we do it better? Um, it's such an important resource and we're missing such a huge opportunity to engage students for everyone's benefit. I heard there was a lot going on overseas um, with Sparks and with um, Sparks and in England with the and Scott in Ireland with the National Student Engagement Project in Ireland and even Wise Wales and the European Student Union. This has been talked about before. So I applied for. I've been very lucky with the old dear departed OLT funding. I applied for and got funding to look at what was happening overseas in terms of student voice, student the engagement of student voice in institutional decision making. Um, so I developed a network with all of those people and, and then looked at Australia where nothing much was happening. Um, I think the University of Western Australia, the Guild, seemed to be the most active, but that was about all. So then my report on this project led to um, my being awarded a National Senior Teaching Fellowship, which enabled me, with the wonderful Anne Carhill, to conduct a series of forums around Australia and through that, after that, we developed the step up principles for student engagement, which you would all know about. Um, we launched, have I run out of time yet? No, we this, launched, is all, this is all great stuff. We launched the principles at a symposium at my university at UTS. And there were so many people there. It was just amazing. And this was the same with the forum. It was like, as I kept saying, this is an idea whose time has come in Australia because there was so much interest and Shelley and Jeff would remember this from those days. Um, the, the forums that I conducted around Australia to develop the principles had a huge, a wide range of everyone, students through to senior managers, professional staff, academics, and really amazing dialogue. And that was the same at the symposium. Um, just the point, when I first started talking about running these forums with everybody, um, someone said, oh, why don't you have separate ones with students? Because the students might be a bit scared to talk up with, every, with their senior managers and things there. And there was absolutely none of that. Was the, they were the most amazing experiences for me and everyone else who was there, I think. So then um, we launched the principles at the symposium. There was a, a huge turnout. And um, there was a big push there to go further. Like, let's not just you'll do your report and that'll be it, as happens a lot, as we know. So it was really the push from students and all university personnel that um, encouraged us to start the, um, the Student Voice Australia pilot. Um, getting it together was not easy, as you can imagine, because well, we asked the universities to chip in. Um, and so that was a major um, with just getting the legal side of it done, the sign off. But it was, we launched it. I employed Kate Walsh, the wonderful Kate Walsh, who really ran it to be the manager, <laughs> totally ran it to be the manager. It's great. Hi, Kate. I think she's still here. Um, and um, yeah, so it's really gone on from there. I don't need, do I need to say any more? No. I, am I going to be asked later about what happened when I came back to New Zealand? I think no, I should that, have Yeah, there'll be some, lots of questions coming. <laughs> so that was fantastic. Thank you very much um, for that. And, and during your presentation, we actually had our final panellist join us. So, um, and you referenced her in your speech. So, um, Shelley, you were, well, it seems like not too long ago at UniSQ, but um, you've moved on to other things. I won't say bigger and better things, but other things. Would you like to do uh, a quick introduction for yourself, please? Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. 
Uh, you could hear me and then I got muted somehow. I unmuted myself again. Um, I am uh, thrilled to be virtually here at uh, University of Southern Queensland. So the accent you're hearing is Canadian, but I'm proud to say that I am a dual citizen. And I always like to joke that I can't then accidentally become a politician. Um, and um, it was University of Southern Queensland, um, how I ended up coming on this journey. So. In 2007, I came for what was to be a one-year academic exchange to teach for the University of Southern Queensland. And right away, and definitely within six months, um, I was hooked and fully an Australian at heart. And I said to my husband and kids, I don't think I want to go back. And they said, we don't either. And we've been here ever since. Um, and uh, then I went, after that first year, um, I went to Bond University for eight and a half years. And then I came back to University of Southern Queensland for four years. And now I am at the um, University of New England and I'm the executive principal student experience. And I've uh, been here for two and a bit years. And um, this is my portfolio. This is my home. This is my wheelhouse. I love, I think it's the best job in the world, getting to think and plan and do all day uh, for, the, for the best of students, together with students and uh, for student experience. So um, I'll stop the introduction, but I just want to tell you one story about Student Voice. So this was um, back to the year 2000, and I was doing my PhD. And um, so in North America, the model was, and, and mostly still is, um, it's a very long process because it's both uh, course-based and research-based. Um, and so it was 2000, and I thought, what the heck am I doing? Because I was teaching full-time, I had research co um, contracts, and my daughter was two years old, and my son was two months old when I started. So my husband would meet me outside of my classes with my baby son so that I could nurse him. Um, I went to a conference in Chicago, um, and this was a, a disability advocacy conference. And I went there and I'd already had my um, thesis research approved. So I'd written my proposal, my committee was happy with it. And what I was doing was studying disability studies students studying online and this was in 2000 and this wasn't people who were studying through say the Hadley School for the Blind this was they'd be the sole blind or visually impaired learner in online learning at various universities um, and mostly not even their educator knew that they were blind and um, so I was going to study the disability study students. I went to this conference and the opening address was nothing about us without us. And so I went to my session uh, for my presentation and I said, um, I'm not going to present on what I was going to present on. What I need is your help. Um, I want to go back and tell my committee that I'm not going to do the research that they've approved. I want to study blind online learners themselves, not disability study students, but blind people themselves. And this story, and it worked. Um, I actually, um, it worked really well because one of the people in the audience was the research director for the Louisiana Center for the Blind. And he said, if you'll start with blind learners, we'll fund you. So it was it was a dream come true. I stayed up all night and slid a proposal under his do hotel room door and the rest was history. But um, so this was a story just to say that each one of us can make a commitment um, to voice and to participation and to partnership and carry forward with that. Perfect. Thank you very much for that, Shelley. And thank you for all of the panellists for introductions. So the format for this, um, we've got some questions that we'll ask the, the panellists individually. Um, if you have any questions during any of um, today's session, if you'd like to either think of them if you're in the room, or you can pop them on the Padlet for those that are online, or if you've got a device in front of you, um, and the Padlet link will be in the chat. So we'll jump into the first questions. Jeff, um, I'm going to ask you the first question. Um, so you've been a great champion uh, for the space for quite some time. 
um, and you've probably seen a lot of changes over the last 10 years. What, what do you think, where do you think we're headed in the next 10 years? What's the future for this space? Uh, yeah, easy question. Um, the, look, I think there's been a huge, look, the number of people here in this room, I think is telling us about the interest, but also the importance that's been put on this. Is this on, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Um, so to me, that's really positive because if this had been 10 years ago, um, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had this many people in the room and we wouldn't have had the diversity of people in the room that we have. We wouldn't have the diversity of the voices that we are, we are currently getting. So I think that's changed. So I'm going to start with the positive and then talk about where I think we still need to go on this journey. Um, and I, I'm actually going to pick an example from my own university, right, just to talk about. So in terms of um, students in decision making, and it was really interesting this morning because I don't want to go on a tangent, but this whole issue of student engagement, student feedback, but actually student voice in decision making, I think we need to actually continue to look at that and understand the difference between all those things, right? Because they're all, they're, they're quite, they're all important. They're all important, equally important, but they're all different, right? And I guess the thing that I was really passionate about was student voice in decision making. And that's gonna bring up the issue of which, well, what decisions, what level of decisions, how are students involved in decision making? How is their voice heard at the table? Um, especially when there'd be a lot of other voices at the table as well. So I'll give you just one really small example. So one of the things I tried to do at uh, UC, where University of Canberra, where I am at the moment, was to have student voice in um, decisions we made around the use of spaces around the campus, right? So this is basically working with estates, with campus estates, right? And I said, well, we need to have a student voice. So, I mean, on, on those decisions that we make. And there was a very simple request <laughs> that came through uh, from students who were part of an LGBTIQ plus uh, community on campus. And it was, we would like a safe space on campus. And they had already worked out where they thought that space should be. Um, and I don't know what it's like in many of your universities, but in a number of the universities I've been at, whether it's a, a, a women's room, a prayer room, or a you know, um, interfaith room, or a Muslim prayer room or an LGBTIQ plus um, space, they're usually tucked away somewhere in a space that nobody wants and estates can't think of what else it can do with it. So therefore they say, oh, that's fine, let's give it to them because that, that'll be fine, we can do that. So what, what, these, what the LGBTIQ plus community students had said is, there's a space that's not being utilized properly in the main courtyard, in the main part of the, the um, university. We think that would be a good space uh, for us. It needed some refurbishment. And um, so I said, okay, I'll, I'll take that to exec. Um, campus Estates can put up something. I'll, I'm happy to be the sponsor because uh, all the projects had to have a sponsor, right? So they, they had to find a sponsor to do that. And I was happy to do that. Um, what really fascinated me was when it got around the table with the other decision makers. Um, first of all, they didn't see the point of having students at the table um, to advocate or to talk about this. They said, no, you're the executive sponsor, you come and talk about it. And I said, well, how can I? Because I'm not part of that community. I'm happy, I'm an ally and I'm happy to work with them and, and help them with this, but it's not my voice, right? I'm happy to have a voice, but I'm not the voice. And so, that was, and, and this went on for quite a few months with this. Then we finally got agreement on it. And then it was went through the planning phase and the students were involved in that. So they, that was good. They were involved in the planning. What, what would it look like? What the facilities would be? All the rest of it, that was fine. And then came up an issue of suddenly someone said, oh, the bathrooms need refurbishing in this area. And we need to have bathrooms that are appropriate uh, for the people who are going to be occupying in this. Ah, oh, suddenly the cost was double um, what it was originally. And then it was, ah, oh, actually we can't do that because that's double the cost. Can we find somewhere else tucked away in a corner, somewhere else in the remote part of the, 
the campus. And I bring this up, not to shame my university, but just to talk about why I think, first of all, the student voice is important, but actually I think the students also need allies as well to help them to make sure that their voice is heard because this is where I'm getting, I know I'm going to take up a bit of time here, but this is where I'm getting about what's changed and what hasn't changed. I think what's changed is we say we'll listen to the student voice. What I haven't seen totally change yet is what we do about those voices and how those voices are actually incorporated into decision making and they're taken seriously in the decision making. That's the bit that I think is still a journey for us. So I'll stop there and you can ask. No, that was really good. Um, and I think, yeah, those those small steps and making those advocates. And, and I think a testament for who's in this room is is a really good sign of what's to come. So thank you very much. Um, we have next question is for Sally. I'm just trying to get my video there. on again. Hang on. <laughs> well, Sally, if you can hear me, I'm so just trying to. Sorry, I'm just trying to start my video. Oh, oh there, there we go. Are. Yeah. Uh, so you're obviously joining us from New Zealand. Um, so we're really keen to um, find out about any of the kind of current projects that you might be working on, given your history in this space. So is there anything interesting that you can unveil or, or tell us about? Well, it has been really interesting because in March 2020, when just as COVID was closing in, I think the University of Australia conference, somebody had COVID and it was suddenly like, oh, no, it's here. <laughs> And um, I packed my bags and came home to New Zealand, um, foreseeing lockdowns and things. And um, after, it must have been after the first, I'd had quite a lot to do with the New, with New Zealand, the New Zealand sector during Student Voice Australia development. A lot of New Zealanders had been over the um, Sheila from the, who's head of the Academic Quality Agency and the National, the New Zealand Union of Students Associations had been over to the symposiums and things that we ran. And when I, after the um, first flash of COVID was over, I got contacted by the Ministry of Education here, who said that the Minister of Education, who was then our Prime Minister, who was our, who now is our Prime Minister, maybe only for another day, sadly, um, he was very keen on pushing student voice. And so he asked if the Ministry asked if I'd work with them on, and the, and the sector agencies and the students associations, to um, to develop a framework that we had along the lines, but obviously in, within the New Zealand context um, for student for the engagement of student voice. So I had a really interesting time working with um, fantastic student leaders, um, some of whom may be there, and um, Alice Mander, who had just developed the national the National Disabled Students Association. He was great, and other. Um, obviously, student leaders, Maori, Pacifica, etc., and we, um, yeah. So I had to, I worked with them first of all on the development of what became Fidia Narao. Um, that was talked about at one of the sessions before, um, and um, that Fidia Narao was the it was designed as a flax bush. You may have seen it if you've um, if anyone has if anyone looks at the New Zealand Union of Students Association website, you'll see it. Um, from student voice to student engagement to partnership. And it sets out four um, principles under which um, partnership has been developed. So, um, and that was really driven by the ministry um, hosted that, that process, but it was driven by the student leaders really. And it was, it was fantastic and it was great for me to come back right into that New Zealand. And then um, that carried on and we took um, Fidia Narao out into the sector and had um, forums with the institutions, with the providers, with sector agencies, um, and well, obviously with the student bodies. And it was all, it was, it was all a, a great experience. Um, people were so positive. It was picked up, first of all, by Tipu Kenna, which is the, was the new body then created um, as a combination of all the, what equivalent of TAFEs, the Polytechs in New Zealand, I think they were the first adopters. And then there was a lot, after we'd finished doing that, I was contacted by other universities like Lincoln and Massey and Victoria University, my old alma mater in Wellington, and um, about developing, you know, what, what they could do for student voice at their university, at their, um, at their institutions. Um, 
So um, carrying on from that, um, we now have Victoria University of Wellington who's joined. That's why we've become, it's become, you've become Student Voice Australasia, which is great. And there was a lot of, and there was a lot of movement, a lot of, a lot happening. Probably the students from New Zealand and the audience would be able to fill in more than I can on that as well. Um, the other thing that happened was that I was approached by Texa earlier in the year, it's probably a bit controversial, but I'm going to mention it anyway, to, um, to run a webinar for senior managers on the engagement of student voice in the, um, in the responding to and preventing sexual harassment and um, sexual assault on university campuses. Um, I won't go into that any further, but that was another bit of work that I've done in the student voice, in the student voice space. Um, it's very exciting that the University of Southern Queensland has now taken over. Piper Bell did a great job for Adelaide when I left. And now the University of Southern Queensland, I'm very happy that they um, have that they, um, have embraced it and are running with Student Voice Australia. Yeah, uh, Australia. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really good to know that we've got a, such a huge advocate over the over the ditch. So, and thank you very much uh, to Anna, obviously, who is our SEA coordinator here at uh, UNSQ. Yeah. She's doing a fantastic job. So, um, we are, we're going to go to some questions to one of our students. So, Jonathan, uh, I've got a question for yourself, and I'm going to try and get this name title right in my, in my question, because it's quite long. So, would you mind sharing uh, more about the process of being part of the Senate Education and Employment Legislative Committee's inquiry into the education and other legislation amendment? Did I get that right? Um, and how did you end up representing Monash at obviously a very um, public hearing? Um, because I think some students in the audience that really work in that uh, or keen to look into that advocacy space might benefit from that. Yeah, thanks for that. And I, I think it's a really interesting question, although I must confess many of my friends find it quite a boring story. So hopefully it's not too boring for the audience. But I think it did reveal some really interesting lessons and a lot of my network really appreciate it as well. So the Monash Graduate Association made a submission to the committee's inquiry um, and in the lead up to that uh, the association was invited to provide a public testimony of sorts uh, to help the senators understand in essence the impact of indexation on HECSTAT uh, and what it was doing to both current and former students in this cost of living crisis. It's a little boring in the sense that the inquiry was in Sydney. My PhD fieldwork is in Sydney, so I'm originally from Melbourne. So instead of flying someone up for a hotel and aeroplane costs, which is an Uber for me just to go down. So that's the boring bit. But the outcome of that was an unfortunate move by the government uh, not to change anything and to leave it as is, and the bill failed. Uh, but it was really interesting to, I guess, see how uh, it was an opportunity for students to really get to the government and demonstrate the real life situations of how government decisions implicate both tertiary education institutions as well as the stakeholders within them. Uh, I found that during our campaign for the increase to the RTP stipend uh, in a lot of the universities, a lot of the focus during change from a student perspective is on the conversation behind closed doors within tertiary institutions. And the potentially negative aspect of that is that the universities in a neoliberal society are very clever at times uh, in closing off because the issue may transcend their individual institution and it may be a government problem. We can't do anything about it, it's the government and that's the best we can do. And so what it really taught a lot of the students that I speak with about this is that if you are an Australian citizen, it's really important to consider your constitutional right as well as arguably obligation to engage with your network change in a, both a democratic sense with your members of parliament, but also recognising that the institutions at a university level in Australia are very clearly regulated by government and changes in government do have clear changes for universities as we're seeing constantly in the current circumstances. But it isn't just about being an Australian citizen, it's also about recognising your citizenship within the university itself. So if you're a student, you are, in my view, a stakeholder in that university, and you do have the right and obligation to partake in those very similar uh, democratic attitudes and behaviours, and your voice, no matter who you are, domestic or international or otherwise, still have the right to speak up. And if 
the universities decide to silence you, uh, it is always your option or choice not to be silenced. And so uh, I think we're very privileged to be in a democratic country, but our universities uh, fundamentally, I would believe, are democratic as well. They don't always act like it, but I think it is fundamental to the nature of our society. So I guess that's a bit of a long-winded way of saying it's a pity the bill didn't pass, but can only try. No, that that's fantastic. And the, that concept of a, a citizen of the university is a really interesting one to probably unpack, you know, as individuals, as we go back into our own organisations as practitioners or, or even as a student to understand what that means. So thank you. Um, question now for Bailey. Um, so in, in some of the sessions in SVA, you've referred to yourself as not being a quiet voice. Um, so reflecting on your experience starting and leading the Students with Disabilities Leadership Collective through the SVA, um, what advice would you give to students who represent quieter voices? Um, I'm going to kind of ignore a little bit of that question with the, the SVA part because I think that is still kind of getting up and running. Um, and I can answer the question much better if I use my time at university and sorry to the corner of the room. Um, so I, I kind of remember when I said that and the thought that I was having at the time was that I feel like I'm constantly talking. I don't shut up. Um, when I'm in meetings, I'm like things will come up and I'll say, well, actually, no, you can't do that because it's not going to be accessible. Or you can't do that because it's going to be transphobic. Or you can't do that because, you know, and it's it just seems to be constant. Um, but I, despite being obnoxious at times, definitely, um, and stubborn, for sure. I, um, I don't feel like anybody's paying attention half the time. Um, certainly not the people that need to be. So, so yeah, I think I'm going to turn that around a little bit and say, well, yeah, I can be shouting and I do sometimes quite loudly and obnoxiously. Um, but I think we have a real power problem in our universities. Um, so yeah, we need to work on that a little bit. So what was the second part of the question again, please? Um, so what advice would you give the to? The advice bit. Yeah, so um, to students. The advice bit would be to, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't have any advice really. Um, I'm flying by the seat of my pants here most of the time. And I think that's probably it, is that we are all flying by the seat of our pants. If we knew how to do this, we would have done this you know, decades ago. Um, and that's probably the thing. None of us, I think, probably know how to do this, right? That's why we're here. We're trying to learn. Um, so be careful with yourselves. Be gentle with yourselves to the ones um, who are fighting the good fighter students in the room. And to the others, I know we heard four really good words this morning, but I've always had another four words in mind, and that's don't be a dick. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, like when you're in those meetings, when you're, when you're talking about um, minority student groups, et cetera, just don't be a dick. Like, you know, we're human. We deserve to be treated like that. I think that's words to live by for, for <laughs> life, right? I think so. That's yeah. a gem. If everyone just writes that down as one piece of information you take back from this conference, that would be <laughs> amazing. Um, Shelley, we might go back online and a, a question for you, Shelley. And uh, realising we've only got about 15 minutes, we do have some other questions, but probably take some Padlet questions if we have some after this one. Um, <laughs> so, Shelley, uh, so you're 30 years into your academic and professional career. Um, what would you say to practitioners uh, who are only just starting? Um, what are some kind of tips to maintain balance in you know whether it's their leadership roles or their or their staff roles, um, yeah. What's some advice for those practitioners are starting out? Thank you so much. Um, I am actually going to t take Bailey's a uh, Petra Bailey's um, book um, and um, slightly tweak the question, knowing that we're we're running short of time. Um, and I do have some advice. So it is thirty years of experience and advice. Um, but I'd like to 
tweak this, channel this into how to get exec to listen. I am very fortunate right now to be on executive and um, I try not to be a dick. And, um, <laughs> and here is what I've learned. And um, I learned this first and foremost through Bond University, where I've had the highest success in really working hand in hand with the student leaders. Um, so a lot of this comes from what worked. Um, just before I get to that, though, I want to let you know what I'm working on right now and what many of us are working on right now. So the government, the new government of Australia turned the job ready graduates element of the legislation of the 50% completion rule. So many of you will have known about this. And so the stick was on the students. It said, if you can't complete 50% of your units, once you've attempted 50% of your units, we're gonna take away your CSP funding. So the stick was on the students. The new government came in and said, we're gonna take that out of legislation. And instead we're gonna give the stick to the universities. So now universities, um, a new consultation paper came out. And so we're all now busily hopefully doing it hand in hand with our students, which is what we're doing at UNE, but building a student support policy and a student support plan, which says these are the ways that we identify our students who are struggling and these are the supports that we make available to them to make sure that students are successful. And the government, as I was saying, the stick, um, is that in, if you haven't, if you can't prove that you've bent over backwards to support the students that you've enrolled, then there's close to a $20,000 fine per student to the universities. So the first way to make your um, executive listen is to put something um, in, uh, for something to be in policy. So to align what you want to happen with what the university has to do because it's a government legislation or policy and it's, it's about money, it's about the budget. But here, so here's five more pieces of advice for me. Number one um, is remember balance. Uh, so again, as Bailey said, be gentle with yourselves. So before I get to how to get executive to listen, prioritize your studies. Make sure that you are getting what you need to get out of this equation um, and, and that you are making sure about what's in it for me. So before I get to the other advice, keep that first and foremost. Um, know your boundaries um, and, and put yourself first. Second is focus. So, you know, like with the 3MT, the three minute thesis or the elevator pitch or what have you, have a strong narrative. Know what it is and focus it in. So make sure you've got your key point and don't let people get distracted. Don't distract yourself by going off on tangents. Stay very focused and zoomed in on what it is that you want to achieve, what you want to get out of it. The third point is that there's power in numbers. So even if it's just your student association or your student council or whatever you call yourselves, that's not enough to make the executive listen. What you need to do is show a rigorous methodology about how you have canvassed the student voices and you're bringing together a powerful student voice. So have you had focus groups? Did you do a survey? Did you do a person on the street type of um, canvassing? So how do you know that this is what your student body wants and that they're behind what it is that you want to do? The fourth thing is to do that through a research methodology. So decide again, is it focus groups? Is it a survey? Is it, and how have you interpreted those results to bring them forward? So that you're bringing your forward, your message saying, this is what we want. And this is how we know that we want it. This is the power of the people. And the fifth is to be part of the solution. So making sure it doesn't work as well when um, the executive are hearing, you know, there's a town hall and people are complaining about we're unhappy about online invigilation, we're unhappy about the assessment feedback, we're unhappy about the 
what are we going to do about it? What are your recommendations for change and how are the students going to be part of it? So as I mentioned, part of um, the success that I had was at Bond University. And one of the things that we did is the students themselves said, we feel that there's not enough closing the loop, for example, on the student evaluation of courses and teaching. So you know those surveys that you fill out at the end of every trimester, at the end of every unit or course that you've completed, and you go, where did that go? Just off into the ether? How come nobody ever listens and nothing ever changes? So they said, we want this to change. We want to know what people are doing with our feedback. Um, and so we worked together and they said the first thing that they needed to do is make sure that all the students were filling out as much as possible. All the students were filling out those surveys and then we were closing the loop on it. So we worked hand in hand and it was the students themselves who recommended and advocated and lobbied for the changes. And we ended up with 95% completion rate of those surveys. And on the top, on the learning moderation management site, so on every unit site, there was a clause that said, here's what you said, here's what we did, here's what we've changed about this unit from your feedback. So there's a real success story about the way in which we can make changes together in partnership with students that make executives stand up and listen. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Shelley. Um, we've got some time for some questions from the audience. So we might start online with the Padlet questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for the panel. And I am really sad that we only dedicated one hour to this. It's a lesson learned on my behalf. Maybe <laughs> next year we'll extend this. Um, we have uh, quite amazing questions online. And um, I, I do encourage everyone to look at the Padlet at the later date and at least to internalize the questions or even start a conversation uh, as well. And um, I. Uh, uh, might, we might have time only for one, uh, but we'll see how we go, so I'll read. Um, so the title is Loud Versus Quiet Voices. Um, and um, so it starts with, uh, um, with this. We all know there is a growing diversity in student cohorts. One challenge to allowing everyone to have their say is that some students or student groups are excessively vocal in the giving their opinions. How can a balance be struck in allowing all students to speak, also uh, limiting those who might try to dominate or even monopolize the various forums? We might try to get um, a practitioner's response and a, and a student's response. Does anyone want to wrap uh, a response in 30 seconds for that? Jonathan? I think in just really brief 30 seconds, um, I think it's about valuing each voice, um, but I've, I've personally never raised my voice and I think it's important that people come together as collaborators on challenges rather than it is us and them. And that is particularly why so many challenges that perpetuated within our tertiary systems has been around uh, collectives against collectives when in fact we are all working together and I think this argument around diversity is is sometimes overheated around identities of individuals when in fact we we do have differences but it's differences that we value rather than the diversity explicitly as being an issue that needs to be fixed and oh gosh in 30 seconds it's a lot harder for me to say that it's I, I really fundamentally don't think we need to raise our voices. We can all speak and all share experiences without necessarily silencing others. And the quieter voices have to be uplifted at times and the loud voices have to be brought down at times without necessarily silencing. That's my only pers perspective in being in very heated discussions on campus, um, but still always positive outcomes because it's unconditional positive regard for each individual rather than uh, about who's right or wrong. Perfect. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, any of our practitioners or Bailey, any other comments on that? Oh, Shelley's hands up. Can I give you just one um, one quick strategy that I, I like to use um, is a buddy system. So always making sure that there's um, at least two students um, together and that if 
if you know that somebody is is quieter and still waters run deep, it's to have a buddy system and so that the other person will advocate um, um, and the person will say, you know, I've noticed that this person or that will nudge them and say to them that they're quiet or they will advocate for them to come forward. This works um, even when it's not a quiet voice, but in a, in a teamwork or a group work situation, pairing people up so that if they notice their buddy hasn't talked for a while, they'll invite them forward to do so. Thanks, Shelley. Might have time for one more question, Anna, from maybe from anyone from the audience in here. Oh, Lucy. Trinette's going to throw that microphone for oh, you. No, I can't. No? Oh, thank you. I can't <laughs> catch. <laughs> um, I was reflecting as we listened that there's a lot of progress being made in individual institutions or pockets within individual institutions. But as a sector, the discussions we're having haven't shifted. I've been out of academia for three years and we're having the same conversations three years on as I was having when I started 15 years ago. Do we pay students? How do we integrate what they say? How do we get them to, you know, get in the room and be heard? And I'm interested to hear the panels um, particularly I think maybe Bailey and Shelley, um, what's the kick up the bum that our sector collectively needs to really shift the paradigm away from what we've been banging on about for 20 years? Stop the tokenistic bullshit. <laughs> so often we have like a disabled person in the room or a trans, I'm trans, I'm gay, I'm disabled, I'm First Nations woman. Um, so often we have that one person in the room and it's a token, that's it. That person is given zero power at all. There's nothing, they're not listened to, they're spoken over, it's there to tick a box to say, hey, we had the undergrad rep on the panel, hey, we had the indigenous person on the panel, we had the disabled person on the panel. I'm like the token crip in every room I'm in. Um, stop it. <laughs> Actually listen to the people that are speaking and screaming and saying, hey, this is what we need to succeed. This is why we're here. We're trying to do great things and be great things and live our dreams out. And you guys are stomping all over it. Stop it. Thank you very much. Shelley, anything to add on that? Wow. <laughs> Um, no, I, I think, you know, um, in, in the phrasing of the question and in Bailey's, I can't go past Bailey's, don't be a dick, but how do we get people not to be a dick? Um, and I, 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 I just, I look at the, the successful lobbying movement and I, I don't know, I can't go past, you know, it's very sobering, um, watching the news today and the um and the referendum and and the results coming through and i don't know it's just hard to hard to answer your question with a whole lot of hope about society not being a dick um and to reinforce what was um being said i think you know something with my research into seeing beyond blindness um uh, one of the things that really stuck out to me is, um, okay, so you brought um, a blind person onto the committee, congratulations, you've met one blind person, you know, it doesn't mean it, it just what Bailey was saying. So I, I think it comes back to what we heard earlier from Jonathan and others about being a citizen and not being bystanders and that um, it takes all of us um, and that when you look at the movements that have um, progressed um, cultures and understanding and, and brought greater awareness and participation and contribution, it's when people have actively come together and been really focused on the change that they want to see and then being part of that change. Yep, Jeff. Just really quickly, um, I think one of the things, and this is just being very practical and very realistic, right? I think if um, you don't have the inherent power uh, yourself, you need advocates or allies um, 
who have who for whatever reason uh, currently are perceived to hold that power um, and so you need to partner up you need to partner up with someone who does have the power and again that may not be the long-term solution it may not be the best solution but it's the way in which you'll get things done um, sorry just yeah. before you carry on. you're right no no, See, no. I, I say I, I do talk a lot no um, that's okay before we kind of move on I do just want to say like I have said a lot of things um, in the last hour but I do <laughs> the people that I work with are great people and I'm fairly certain that nobody would be in this room if they didn't care um, so even with all the things that I've said I do want to acknowledge that um, as angry as I get and as frustrated as I get and as as much as I swear um, at everything I do also see um, beautiful souls here in each and every one of you um, and I do appreciate all of that um, and I really want to not do a but but there's a little bit of a but um, being a nice person isn't enough at the end of the day you know <coughs> you can be the greatest nicest person but at the end of the day we also need you to kind of do your job and help us out a little bit because we're really struggling down here um, so yeah, but keep the beautiful because I like that too. That's really awesome. Thank you. No, that was a really lovely point to end on. Um, and if we can all go out, you know, back to our institutions and, and be advocates and, and find the people that have the power to make the change, you know, I think that's what we're all here for. So um, thank you to, to everybody from the panel, those that joined us online and, and those in person. Um, I really appreciate your openness and your honesty and your your well thought through answers. I think um, hopefully people have uh, got something out of today's session. Um, we are gonna move on to the final session for today, which is the explorative workshop. So we'll engage those, uh, those brains again for the last session for the day. So those who are with us online, there'll be an, the next Zoom session that you'll need to join in the program. Um, and it's gonna be shared in the link as well, I believe from Anna. Um, and for those uh, in person, we'll be here. So if you want to take a quick break, if you need to go to the bathroom, if you're in person, and uh, congratulate the panel. Thank you.